Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Vancouver Asian Film Festival's Diversity in Filmmaking Series Virtual Panel Series. My name is Lynn Lee. I'm the Festival Director of VAF, and I'm here to welcome you and uh, to thank you for tuning in to watch today. Let's begin by acknowledging the land that we're gathered on and also streaming from is the traditional and ceded territory of the Coast Salish nations, including the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. There's a lot happening at FAF, but I'm going to tell you all about it at the end of our session because we have an amazing program for you today with a lot of panelists we can't wait to hear from. So please remember to stay around uh, after the panel's over to hear what's gonna be happening at FAF right after. So today, our panel is actually the sixth and our last of our series. And we're very grateful for all the support that we've been getting from our sponsors and from our community. So let me take a moment to thank them. Our diversity in filmmaking virtual panel series cannot happen without the support of the British Columbia Ministry of Tourism, Arts and Culture, the Multiculturalism Branch, and also tell us Story Hive. We're also co-presented by community organizations, including Exploration, Vancouver Asian Heritage Month Society, and Crazy Eights, Celluloid Social Club, Hapapalooza, Pacific Canada Heritage Center Museum of Migration, Rain Dance Vancouver, Vancouver Short Film Festival, and Women in Film and TV. We're also very, very grateful for the media partnership of YVR Screen Theme. Now you can watch this panel because it's going to be recorded uh, after it's over at our FAF YouTube TV and also our Facebook. You can also watch it at TELUS Optic TV video on demand educational channel in the near future. And what's more, YVR Screen Scene is also going to be uh, streaming this on their podcast. So please watch out for that. There's a lot to be grateful for, and we want to take a moment to thank the healthcare and frontline and the essential workers who've been keeping us safe and sane throughout this crazy period. And I also really want to thank our producing team, including Regina Liang, Nash Dusdimetha, who is our tech guru, who has been making all these streams uh, very, very smooth and happen magically. And also our other producers, Arnold Lim and Joshua Lam and Mayumi Yoshida. And um, we're all very grateful to Mayumi because she's put a lot of effort in putting to get this panel, uh, speaking with a lot of guests and inviting them on, and also helping us invite Sabrina Ferminger, who is our moderator today uh, from YVR Screen Scene, who has very generated, uh, generously sponsored our panel as well. So because there is a lot to, to uh, cover, I just want to bring our attention that today we are focusing on uh, helping uh, our black community and uh, shining a spotlight on the black community and uh, help their voices be heard and help us understand how we can help them. So there are a lot of organizations that we actually want to um, call upon and have our support, including Cicely Bain Consulting, Black Lives Matter Vancouver, Afro Van Connect, Hogan's Alley, Black Health Can, Black Youth Helpline. So all the handles on social media, you can uh, take note of and uh, look them up uh, on, online. And also please support Black in BC Community Support Fund for COVID-19 and Vancouver Black Therapy and Advocacy Fund. So it'll be great if you can all support them. So without further ado, I'm very, very excited um, to introduce Sabrina Ferminger, uh, who is an award-winning journalist. Um, and uh, I, I will not go through the full bio, but I'm very happy that she can help us bring together the Amplifying Black Voices in BC Film panel to you. Thank you, Sabrina. Thank you, Lynn. <laughs> Thank you, Vaf. I am deeply honored to be here today and I feel a great responsibility as well. Conversations around race in the film and TV industry are nothing new. They've been happening forever, 
in audition waiting rooms, in classes, between takes on set, in diver diversity and inclusion panels. People of color have been talking about whiteness and white supremacy and white privilege in the industry forever. But in most cases, we're talking amongst ourselves. I've sat on diversity panels where the only people talking and the only people in the room were other people of color. People who already know the reality of navigating this industry while black or indigenous or Asian or marginalized in any way. It's preaching to the choir. How do we stand a chance of making any lasting change if everyone isn't part of the conversation? The answer in my view is that we don't. We don't stand a chance of making change without the gatekeepers and the stakeholders actively participating in the dialogue. And the beauty of this tumultuous moment in history is that people are tuning into the discussion who have never tuned into this discussion before. We have an opportunity to make some real change. And we begin that journey with listening. My name, as Lynn said, is Sabrina Mara Furminger. I am honored to be your moderator today to facilitate this conversation and also to learn. Here are the few I statements that you'll hear from me today. I am a non-Black person of color. I have biases that have been informed by white supremacy. I am sitting in my discomfort and I am confronting my own complicity in the power structures that uphold white supremacy and anti-Black racism. I am honored to facilitate this honest conversation about how we as a community can end anti-Black racism and elevate and uplift Black voices. I commit to learning. I commit to listening. I invite you to join me in doing the same. So let's begin. Today, we share the space with Miriam Berry, Rukia Bernard, and Andy Hodgson. Miriam Berry is a multidisciplinary artist from Norway and the Gambia. She's an actor, writer, and producer in both the theater and film industry. Rukia Bernard is a Leo Award-winning and UBCP Actra Award-nominated actress. She's best known for playing Doc on sci-fi's popular post-apocalyptic vampire series, Van Helsing. Andy Hodgson is a cinematographer and producer at Red Castle Films. He's worked on projects such as my daughter's favorite show, the Netflix original series, Project MC Square, and his latest feature film, the incredibly thrilling Woodland. Later in the stream, we will welcome Jem Garrard, the showrunner of Vagrant Queen, and Zach Lepofsky, the director of Freaks, MechX4, and Kim Possible, and the elected director representative at the British Columbia branch of the Directors Guild of Canada. For now, they're listening. Mariam, Rakia, Andy, thank you for your generosity and your time <laughs> and being here today. Um, let's begin with that. Why are you here today? Why have you agreed to participate in this panel? Mariam, can we start with you? Definitely. Um, there are so many reasons why I'm here today. And I think the biggest thing is that like, I have to show up for my life and I have to show up for my other black artists in this time, particularly. Um, I think as a black person right now, like I'm navigating so many emotions, not just the pandemic, but mm -hmm. all the police brutality and the conversations that we've been having in the community for years, rising up to the surface. And it is a hopeful time because I'm seeing systematic change on, or the hope of systematic change worldwide. But at the same time now we're having these conversations again and conversations with people who are catching up. So it's learning how to bridge those spaces. And so I'm here to also um, connect with Andy and Rakia and then also just amplify my own voice and say that these are my experiences as a black artist here in the Vancouver film and TV industry. And just talk about some very specific incidents that I have experienced that I've raised up to <laughs> in so many different conversations, but now I feel like more people are tuning in and maybe hearing me in a different way. So that's why I'm here. Mm, wonderful. What about you, Andy? 
Uh, well, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, I'm grateful to be here. Uh, in honesty, I wanted to represent um, being half black and half Latino. I find that there is not only racism on the black side of it, but also on the Latino side. Mm -hmm. And I kind of wanted to represent for the film industry in Vancouver, um, been in the industry for about 16 years, and the number of black people have definitely increased in the industry, uh, giving us a bit more of a fighting chance uh, with sort of getting the better jobs. Uh, you know, getting into those rooms, getting sort of the, the the feel of what it is to kind of work in and around sort of a white, uh, uh, more of a white dominated uh, platform uh, as the film industry. So I wanted to kind of uh, give you guys sort of the uh, overall look of how I personally have dealt with being here the last 15 years and also in South America. And I feel that not only in talking to uh, people of my age around their 40s, but also to talk to new filmmakers who are of color, who are just starting out in this industry and how you know we could potentially help them grow and understand how to kind of farther themselves in their career. Wonderful. Rakia. Hi. Um, Hi. Thanks, for thanks for having me, guys. And I think it's very important um, and I feel grateful that uh, the Vancouver Asian Film Festival has decided to host this panel. Um, I've been a part of many diversity and inclusion panels before, committees. Um, I feel an obligation as an actor who has been doing this a long time um, to share my experiences and to pass them on. There's a lot of younger black actresses and actors in general who look up to me and reach out to me and I'm in constant contact with them, trying to help them not make the same mistakes as I have made, of course. Um, but I've just seen and heard too many consistencies with young actors who are half my age experiencing the same discrimination that I've experienced from when I started my career until now. Um, mm -hmm. It has to change. And being black, being an actor, it is my duty that I'm here to share my experiences with everybody, especially now that people are actually hearing it on a core level. That's why I'm here. All right, let's get into this then. This is, it sounds like a simple question, but it's not, it's a big question. Is the Vancouver film and television industry racist? Does racism, discrimination, white supremacy exist in this industry up here? Why, why not? Who wants to take that first? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, Sabrina, I'm just gonna say this right now. Um, it, this is a very challenging question because as actors, as directors, as producers, we answer to people, right? Yes. Our higher ability is dependent on being a good team player and like ready to rip. So I, you know, it's been challenging for me and I'm sure for you, Mariam and Andy, to speak up about like, that was a microaggression. Yeah. You're in the middle of a shoot, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna preface my answer by saying that, like even simply being here and speaking my truth, I put my career, which I've been doing for 20 years, on the line. Mm -hmm. Yes, there is racism here in the Vancouver film industry and in the film industry, period. Yes. I feel uh, in, in terms of the film industry in Vancouver, I've definitely have felt it, you know, numerous times. Um, most of you that might be watching, uh, I used to have a big afro and going into some meetings with maybe some bigger producers, you know, I would kind of think, should I shave my head? Should I maybe wear a hat? Or mm -hmm. are they going to accept me for the way I look? Or, you know, maybe perhaps wearing these kind of shirts that I have about 10 of them, you know? So it, it, there, there has been times that I've definitely thought I've been looked at, whether it's been a, a cinematographer role or the producer role in terms of, well, you're a person of color, so I don't know what you could bring to the table. So mm -hmm. I definitely think it is kind of hidden behind the sort of, uh, uh, <laughs> behind the screen, um, no pun intended, but also in terms of, we work on a lot of white content. 
Mm. Yeah. You know, so as a cinematographer is I'm shooting a lot of white content. You know, I'm shooting a, a lot of Hallmarks. I'm shooting a lot of, uh, um, you know, Netflix. And mm -hmm. so I feel uh, as the producer in me, uh, I'm also still doing white content, but wanting to sort of uh, steer away from that and bring more black content in the community in Vancouver. Mm. Man. And I wanted to say that like Rakia just spoke the whole truth. <laughs> and that's like something that I wanted to say as well in terms of like us being here as black artists and black bodies on the screen right now saying like, these are our experiences. Like we are putting our career on the line and but this is something that we're consistently fighting against as creatives in the industry. Um, yeah. 100% the Vancouver film industry is racist and yeah. anti-black in a lot of ways that it manifests itself from the casting room to the writing room, et cetera, et cetera. And I think I was also really shocked by like a lot of the incompetence sometimes that I encounter on set. Even like Andy um, was spoke about as well, like with black hair, mm -hmm. coming to hair and makeup and they don't know how to do my hair and it's obvious. Mm -hmm. And then when I'm sitting in the chair and seeing this white hairdresser struggling to figure out what to do, and it's like, oh, okay, I think I'm gonna just throw this in a bun because I don't know what to do. It's like, okay, I'm thinking in my head, like, okay, there are so many conversations here that slipped because you knew that you hired me and you know what my hair looks like. So where, like, how could this have like been dropped? And then we, we also know the politics of black hair and what it means to showcase it and celebrate it on screen. Mm -hmm. This was also a very like big lost opportunity um, for you as the production. And I feel like these these things are really, really important at all in terms of like the difference between equity and equality. That like, you cannot say that you are a hairdresser and then you don't cater to a whole population of people. Mm. And, 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 and can I add to that? And then, cause on every single production I've done, I've done my own hair. Yeah. Hair department. Every been, single. Every single one. Wow every single one. The last movie I did, it was a young uh, swing, meaning she does hair and makeup. Mm -hmm. And I taught her what to do so that when I'm on set, she knows how to, you know, put me back so continuity works, right? Yeah. Um, but in the past, it's been a lot of having a mirror in my makeup bag and my hair bag so that they hold the mirror up for me and I'm the one putting my hair back in order. Mm -hmm. and, it's and, like, and there's not, sorry, Mariam, there's not no. one black actress that I have known, and I know a lot, that has not had this exact same experience at least once in their career. Mm -hmm. Not one. Mm -hmm. And I want to add to that point, uh, guys, and absolutely correct. I mean, I'm not an actor, and I'm sure if I went into their trailers, they'd be confused about my hair. But the one thing that, uh, you know, I notice a lot, uh, that kind of, you know, puts me, rubs me the wrong way is I'll be staring at a call sheet and I get to set and never are black actors, they're number ones. I mean, never. if you look at all these MOWs, I've shot probably the last year, four or five MOWs. They're always the number three, the four, they're the, the boyfriend or the girlfriend or the best friend of the, you know, and, and every time we, you know, it's funny because when you see a black person on a set, you kind of click right away. And it's kind of that thing. You just give them yeah. the nod and they're like, hey. You're both you're there. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> but the reality is, is that, yes, they and we are being left out in, in sort of these higher positions, uh, you know, in terms of being the number one or the number two leads. Yeah. Um, so they get kind of thrown into, into the background. Of, oh, you're the supporting role. Okay, you'll be the store clerk that they come for like two minutes and say hello and that's kind of your your piece so yeah it's yeah. it's it's blatantly out in the open we've seen it and if many of you have seen a call sheet i can tell you many a times it's never the number one or the number two mm -hmm. yeah i've only been a number one once in my whole career Jem actually got me close but i think the robot in android oh. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> That's right. Victor, but there was a you know, I get that. Um, I was number two there. Um, and then recently, um, Andy Alvarez's uh, Crazy H film, uh, Soul, I was number one. But I've been doing this 20 years. And up until those two more indie projects, um, the highest I've gotten was a number three. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And when I when we did the page count and everything, I really should have been number two on that mm. call sheet. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I just wanted to as well like highlight something that Rukia just said in terms of like her having to do invisible labor on set. And it's mm -hmm. like we're not compensated or even credited for the things that we have to do to elevate your work or the production <laughs> in the end. So it's Dude, like some I, diversity and inclusion work. It's like, okay, now. Um, a cultural consultant because I'm also ha having to tell you how to interact with me as a black artist and how to respect mm -hmm. our stories or our bodies when you're showcasing them on screen. So I feel like that is also another huge issue that like we need to start talking about and we need to start seeing it and appreciating it for what it is. Like this is labor that should be compensated and valued and appreciated. And not added to the hairstylist uh, portfolio because oh. Well, that's how they're hired, right? Like, oh, this right. is our cast. And can you do that? This is what we're looking for our show, this kind of look. And can you design this and whatnot? They'll go to, to head of hair for that. And then, of course, head of hair will have their website with their portfolio. And there's my work. And I've tried negotiating to get some compensation for hair. It doesn't work. And they're like, yeah. no, <laughs> no, we have a hair department. I'm like, they don't know what they're doing. Yeah. Exactly. Even uh, YouTube videos I've sent, they won't watch them. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. Do you think, you know, given that Vancouver is such a service town and we are servicing these, you know, a, a lot of these, you know, family rom-coms and the Christmas movies and that it, where the formula that they use extends to how they use black characters, Asian characters and other characters from marginalized groups, you know, usually like, putting, slotting us either into a supporting role um, or if it's to be a black lead, it has to be an all black cast. You know, you can't have any, you know, people from mixing, like right. from, like, do you think that it is going to be possible to fight the anti-black racism in this industry while we service shows that have this formula? Um. I don't know. Um, that's one of the issues with Vancouver in general is that we are, as you said, a highly service town, meaning for anyone who doesn't know what that means, we service a lot of American production. And I don't know what the statistics are, but I would argue it's about 90 to 95% of the productions done here in Vancouver are American. I think that's uh, actually very close to what the statistics were in the last couple of years, like more okay. than 80%. Of yeah, service huge amount. I mean, a lot of there should be way more Canadian content. Family Law, I think, is like the only show that is shooting that will probably hopefully. <laughs> so <laughs> Zach Lepofsky, that, who is with the DGCBC, has given us a stat of 95%. 95%, right? Now, Canadian content is a different discussion to have because there's, uh, I, I, people of color are highly misrepresented. Uh, sorry, not misrepresented, underrepresented in Canadian content. Um, mm. But um, if we are servicing American productions, it's a part of American culture, which is, you know, related to Canadian culture, but it's American. And if they are showing number three and down on the call sheet as um, marginalized societies, I don't know if we in Vancouver as an industry have much of a say in how we are able to recast that. I know casting directors try really, really, really hard yeah. to do it. Um, I'm often brought in as the ethnic alternative to try to be like, hey, I know you want this kind of look, but we could do this as well. Yeah. Um, but it's a it's an uphill battle when you're working for someone, even yeah. as a producer here in Canada. So I, I, don't, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, if you look at uh, the, the service town, I think internally things have to change from the ground up, that being the overall picture of Hollywood mm, and yeah. who started Hollywood and who runs Hollywood. Because obviously these MOWs are not going to go 
to Africa or they're not going to go to, you know, New Orleans or, or places where it's heavily drawn with black people uh, to go and make their movies. So they look at alternatives like Vancouver. You know, it's very white. It's very safe, uh, you know. So internally, I find it it's going to be a long road in order to even as a service town to be able to get more black people up here or producers, uh, big, bigger directors, um, you know, bigger productions who are solely run by black people. Um, therefore for us being here, it's going to have to be internally. And I think as we continue down the road of this uh, sort of battle, we as the people, we as the filmmakers have to bring that out to the forefront. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all I'll say is like echo what something that you said in the beginning, Sabrina, which I feel like we need allies in like everywhere. <laughs> like we need allies at the top who are thinking about this and advocating for uh, black voices, black leads, et cetera, um, to see that systematic change. It can't just be like the actors and it can't just be um, the people here in Vancouver even, like it needs to be everywhere. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I, I wanna go back to that idea of um, the, the phrase that Rakia brought up, microaggressions, which I, I think is something that maybe, unless you experience them on a regular basis, you might, you might not know what that actually is. Rakia, can you talk a little bit more about what microaggressions are mm -hmm. and, and describe some of them that, I mean, we talked about the hair, that is a, a huge mm -hmm. one. We, we talked about, you know, being the tokenism of being the only, you know, the only black person on a, on a call ship. But like, what, what are, what is my, what are microaggressions and where do you encounter them in this industry? Um, uh, I encounter them a lot in the hair and makeup department, um, yeah. or not necessarily department, um, but also in the context of hair and makeup um, mm -hmm. and skin, um, which is highly, well, that's kind of what defines me as black, I guess, right? My skin and my hair. Um, and um, microaggressions are um, comments uh, that, though may seem innocent, um, are really just kind of poking and showing my blackness to me as if I'm other than. For example, um, you know, my hair, I wear it natural um, majority of the time. And uh, like Andy said in his story before when he had his beautiful big fro, I remember it, um, it you know, people be like, oh my God, your hair is so, I just, uh, Not and then all of a sudden, I've been... a, a, a stranger, like, yeah, okay, here we go. Three, three out of three black people have had this exact same experience. <laughs> and it's, we're talking about complete strangers putting their hands on my body without talking to me, without asking me. And without thinking like, this is a weird thing. It's like, you know, when I walked my dog when she was alive, people would be like, oh, blah, blah, blah. And so it feels the same. Like I'm treated like a dog, like a, like a thing, like I'm on display to be gawked at and oh, I'm amusing, right? Um, a friend of mine just posted on her Instagram about uh, being in the makeup chair and the makeup lady was saying, oh, you, I, you just have the best skin. Black people have the best skin. And she's like, what does that mean? And I've heard this many times, and as someone who's battled acne, I was like, oh, it's my, yeah, I've been using the skincare line, right? <laughs> um, but it, it, it's a comment on my skin because I'll see other actresses who are Caucasian in the chairs beside me, they're never getting that. Hmm. They're never getting that. And so, you know, most people don't go about their lives having their race being called to them at multiple corners as they're just trying to go about their day. Mm -hmm. Those are microaggressions. Mm -hmm. I can't and, just be a human. Yeah, and just to put like Vancouver on heat a little bit, I think even in, in Vancouver specifically, there's such a limited understanding of what blackness is mm -hmm. that I find as well, like in the room, in the audition room, that it's like, do it, do it one take. And then it's like, okay, so Mary, can you just, can you just be a little bit more 
urban, mm-hmm. you know, like mm-hmm. a little bit. And like that happens all the time. And yep. it's, it's like, okay, let's question. <laughs> it's like, now we got to stop the audition. Now we got to question why you're giving me these directives. So you have mm-hmm. only a certain understanding of what a black person sounds like, or like this type of black person based on the role and the description should sound more like this. So you want me to sound like more ghetto, you want me to sound et cetera, et cetera. And it's like, these are these are huge moments of microaggression, which mm-hmm. I would also define as like acts, like small acts of violence. Yeah. Because now you, once, once again, now you're othering me and now you want me to perform for you, but also perform your understanding of blackness. Well, I'm a black person. This is my voice. Yeah, yeah I'm an actor and I can change it up, but be careful with what you're asking of me because yeah. it's, it's, it's very ignorant. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, wh- what do you think your non-Black peers failed to understand about working in this industry, uh, acting on camera, working behind the camera, creating art while Black? What do you want them to know? I think, first of all, is sort of a <laughs> that we probably work harder to get to where we need to be than mm-hmm. potentially others uh, of different colors. Um, but also, you know, and just just want to go back to the microaggression because I find there's such a difference. And now that, and I go back to the hair because when I had my big afro, the small microaggressions, it's just like somebody coming up to me like, yo, what up? You know, and they start <laughs> all of a sudden talking to me like I live in LA or I'm, I'm in, you know, Texas. Or, and then I sort of start speaking on behalf, never say the N word, you know, sort of that. And, and they get taken up by like, what, you're not like a real black person, so I can't really like swag with you. <laughs> so I find that a lot in Vancouver uh, in terms of, you know, the sort of uh, smaller microaggressions. So I think in going back to your question is, you know, to let them know that <laughs> we're also regular people and not to stereotype mm. of what we see on TV or these rappers or, you know, because again, it, you know, we're articulate, we're beautiful. Mm-hmm. and we have great voices. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I think something else that like non-black artists don't understand is like and I find it specifically um for black artists that are interested in telling their own stories and creating their own content like in Vancouver that is such an uphill battle. I have yeah. so many conversations with like producers and just gatekeepers that um keep telling me that like oh this this project is not feasible because there's like there's no there's no black artists here. We also mm-hmm. need to change that narrative. Like I'm always huge on that, where I'm like, stop erasing us. Stop mm-hmm. erasing us. I'm, I might say this three times, just stop erasing us. Cause we're here and we've mm-hmm. been here and we create, and then you cannot erase us and the opportunities that we are asking for to put our stories forward. And then you can't mm-hmm. turn around and then say, oh, there's nobody here. Well, you're denying us at every level. Yeah. yeah. And specifically, I think here in, um, Vancouver as well, you have to interrogate that and understand the historical events that happened in which that was per, um, perpetuated. The erasure of Hogan's Alley, et cetera, et cetera. Just the erasure of black history and the black presence on these territories in general. Yeah. Like there's like, that's why when anyone's like questions that and stops it, like, like it, it's really hurtful. It's really hurtful because you're not able to like elevate your community. You're not able to tell the stories that you think matter. Um, because of their understanding what's happening in the community. When it's like, I am from the community and I'm telling you, like we're here and we're ready. And like, we've been knocking on that door for a very long time. Yeah. Um, what What is your reaction to the current discourse in the zeitgeist about anti-black racism and blackness? Like are we, and by we, I mean mainstream media, people on social media, the independent media getting it right are we moving in the right direction with the conversation? Like, where can we improve? Well, I don't know. Um, it's funny. I, I'm, I feel hopeful because I am hearing uh, non-Black people, uh, mainstream, saying things that have been discussed amongst the Black community in diversity and inclusion board meetings and whatnot for years, for generations. Um, I'm hearing it coming out of mouths that don't look like me. 
And that's the first time I've ever experienced that. So that gives me hope. Um, I worry that people will consider it a trend mm, yeah. and that things will peter off and the next thing will happen and that'll be the focus of the cultural zeitgeist. Um, so I, I, I hope and pray that enough is shifted in this moment that it shifts. It like we can genuinely see it in the future that something has shifted. Yeah. Um, but well, only time can tell, right? And we can only see what happens. But until then, I'm keeping my foot to the pavement. I'm not stopping. Yeah. Um. What? What are? How will we know when we've dismantled anti-black racism and white supremacy in our industry? Like, what are what are some of our what are some things that that you want to see happen? Well, first of all, again, it's it's kind of like politics, you know, until somebody at the top is not racist or is uh, of some other color. Um, it's going to be pretty tough. But I think we as the people, what I'd love to see happen is, for example, me for getting a, a higher role as a producer in a big show that, mm -hmm. you know, I kicked out the six white guys <laughs> that uh, <laughs> that are running that show. Um, you know, and I, I think that's where change comes. But in, until then, there needs to be a fight and sort of those voices put out. And mm -hmm. without the sort of help with the mainstream media, and, and, and I just go back to who started Hollywood and who runs Hollywood. And until any of that changes, it, it's, it's sort of a, a never ending battle. But I would love to see uh, bigger roles for uh, bigger black actresses or actors. Um, you know, producers like myself or other producers landing some of those bigger jobs because then again, we're able to hire who we want, you know, and, and funny enough, uh, the other day I got a text uh, from a PM who's of color and he says, I want to build a team of color, you know, would you be interested in being the cinematographer for a couple of my movies? And I said, for sure. So that's what needs to happen is the money exchange where the money to make the productions is going is going to the wrong group. So if, if there is some sort of balance and shift in that, in where those billions of dollars go every year, and they were to say, hey, Rakia, here's, you know, $5 million, go make your black movie, or Andy, go make your movie, or, you know, Miriam, go make your movie. I think until then, it's an uphill battle, but there is change, and, and it's coming. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love like thinking about like achievable actions and like action items. And I feel like specifically for Vancouver, it's like, come on. In terms of like the indie scene, like we can do better in terms of showcasing yeah. black voices here and supporting yeah. black creators and black filmmakers. Mm -hmm. Because when I go to like these events, like um, even for Crazy Eight, like I, it was so good to see you there, Rikia. I'm like, <laughs> yes, come on now. Like, <laughs> like we've been here for a very long time and it's like, as a black person, I always feel that when we're not there. Mm -hmm. I always feel that. You felt that. Yeah, I, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. I've always wanted to do Crazy Eight film. And after all these years, someone finally asked me. I've been asked before, but they were bit parts that I wasn't interested in doing. And yeah. I didn't feel it was appropriate for me to be taking that part for, from an actor who might be starting out mm -hmm. um, to be the, excuse me, you can't go in there. And I was just kind of like, that's what you thought? Okay. And, no, in I'll pass. and in reality, Rakia, who asked you was a Latina woman. Yes. Right? Yeah. So it wasn't a white man. So here, here's what I'm going for, One. right? Exactly. It's, yes. You, yes. You got to look at it that way, right? It's in, in, I guess, again, going back to we can only empower ourselves. And it, it hurts me deeply mm -hmm. to know that it took a Latino woman to hire a black woman in order to be a lead, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So where, where is the problem here, right? So that, mm -hmm. um, th that actually leads me to a question that was uh, put to me by Lynn from VAF, who, who wanted to know how non-black people of color, uh, people like myself, people like the people behind VAF who work in the industry, like how can we support each other to expand the industry so that we all have opportunities and we all have a seat at the table. 
That's a big question. Um, I, I, I think that part of it is an old guard of hiring that needs to shift mm. and that's pressure. Um, I'd personally love to see some statistics of Canadian productions and what are the racial, uh, uh, like who's getting hired and who's getting hired in what capacity. Um, I'd like to see what the CRTC has to say about that. Mm -hmm. uh, they do require a certain amount of points for certain productions to be made. And that usually happens within a certain group of friends, right? Um, mm -hmm. and, and if there's a way of mandating to break out of your friend, I mean, and I get that it's nice to work with people that you've worked with in the past. You know, you've got a good thing going. There's a lot of stakes. I get that. But if people of color are not given a chance and not given a shot, then we are going to perpetuate these ideal, uh, this white supremacist ideology here in Canada and also in America, but I'm not American, so I can't comment on that even though I did. And, yeah. um, and that needs to change. Yeah, uh, but, you, but you might not be in America, but you are seen in America through the, the productions that you participate in, right? Because we, mm -hmm. we are a service industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, for yeah. me, I, I'd say I would love to see some sort of these grant platforms. You know, personally, I've gone for a lot of grants and <laughs> I'm going to say it, even though it's live, I see a lot of people landing the same grants and those people yeah. are black. Yeah. So whether it's a black grant to yeah. help black artists, emerging artists, you know, where is where are those avenues for us? Yeah. You yeah. know, because we're always looked as. Uh, like Marian said, you know, we're looked as ghetto, we're looked at, uh, um, um, you know, th third world, underclass, undervalued. Well, where are those grants that are just going to help black artists get their voices up? That's what I would love to see in Canada. And there, and there used to be, I remember like even City TV used to have a diversity program for programming. This was, oh God, I want to say like 10 years ago or so, I remember mm. seeing that. I was like, oh, that's cool. And then, you know, last year, Andy knows I was looking at as a plan for a grant and trying to get a film made and there's nothing there for in the indie. It's, that's a problem in the indie scene in general yeah. um, that crosses all races. Uh, but then to be a person of color trying to, to, to do that, no, it doesn't happen. Um, very soon, we will welcome our two director producers, Zach Lepofsky and Jem Gerard to the conversation. What would you like to hear from them and, and, and people in positions of power like them, you know, moving forward from this moment? I just wanna say um, I'm interested in just like a real honest conversation from them in terms of what, what, what are, what's happening in those rooms that we're not in. Mm. And like, what are those conversations actually like when we're not there? And like, like, yeah, I think starting from there, it's like, who is advocating for us? Are they not advocating for us? Are we even brought up in the conversation? I want to know like those details from them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, then, well then why don't we welcome Zach Lepofsky? and Jem Gerard, who have been listening in. <laughs> Hi, Zach. Hi, Jem. You've been listening to our conversation today. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, Thank you, guys. I guess, you know, you've, you've been sitting here for, for the last 45 minutes listening. You've been taking in all of the articles and discussions that's been going on over the last few weeks. Um, what is your initial reaction to everything that you have heard from our Black artists today? A any surprises, Jem, Zach? Um, no, no, no surprises. I think we, um, and thank you all, uh, for sharing, um, your stories, uh, as well. Um, and I've just been, you know, here listening and kind of thinking on, uh, my own experiences, uh, in Vancouver, uh, on productions, um, you know, where we, have been where I've been in, uh, you know, a position to uh, hire black actors. I think I'm I'm grateful now as a showrunner. Um, I have far more power to now not just bring on uh, black actors, but to uh, be able to hire creatives. Um, you know, 
uh, in the room, writers and directors as well. Um, I'm grateful now that I'm in that position to do that. But um, before when I was working as a director for hire, there were certainly moments um, that kind of had shocked me coming from a indie background and Andy just to touch on something you said when you come from that indie background and you're sort of more in control of the stories you're telling and the people you're hiring it's kind of a shock when you start working professionally uh to sort of hear some of those conversations that that go on um and you know like Miriam said um I, you know I'd be happy to share those um and be honest with my experience as a white creative um, when conversations about hiring black people have come up. Well, I, I, I'm sure I can speak for everybody. We, we're definitely interested in hearing what kind of, like what what are the conversations that you're having in the room about hiring black artists? This, um, this sort of happened more early on in my career because like I said now, you know, it's I'm in a, a different position to kind of have a more of a say, but you know, as a director for hire, you, you do have a say in, in who you're hiring, but you don't have the final say. Um, and, you know, I remember early on in my career being in a casting room with the producer uh, and, um, you know, someone had just, uh, a black actor had just come in and, and read for the part and left and, and we were talking after. And I made a comment that, okay, I really liked this person. You know, you usually send three selects to the, the network. I uh, really like this person. And what was said back to me, I'm going to remember for like the, you know, the rest of my career, I was so naive and ignorant about what was going on. What was said back to me was, you've, you've already, uh, we've already hired a black person. We've already got a black cast member. So this is going to be, really hard to sell that was what was said to me and I didn't you know my kind of ignorance didn't understand what that meant and what was what I was kind of being told was that we're 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 not going to be able to uh sell this film you know whatever that was if that was the their international market or whatever it was we're going to have trouble selling this film if we have more than uh one black actor in this film and I was just uh, I was I was shocked um, uh, and kind of, you know, my eyes were open there. And I think, um, Rakir, you, you sort of mentioned something earlier on where it, in when you're in these positions, you then, you kind of, you're wondering how much do I kind of push back on this? Um, am I, you know, going to get fired? Um, you know, what... How much power do I have over this moment? And it was shocking because, like, you know, I just come off of a really kind of progressive show where we fought really hard to find uh, a black trans actress as the lead role. Mm. And um, suddenly here I was in this room with a white producer being told that two black actors is too much. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to name any kind of companies or names now because the fact is it, it is, it's all of them in Vancouver. It's all of the companies. I guarantee they all, you know, the companies making these service uh, MOWs, they've all had that same conversation. They've all used the excuse that they we can't sell it, you know, and they've sort of said, you know, been apologetic about it, but just that it comes down to money and, we, we, you know, we can't sell that and so it is like Andy said a way bigger discussion of of changing that of changing of not just kind of being complacent in okay that's an excuse yeah I'll take that excuse and, and just sort of saying um it's it's a, yeah it's a far bigger discussion and I think that it's going to take all of us uh, by all of us I mean white people collectively to speak up um, when that happens, because it's been uh, yeah. Because I think yeah, when I think it happens, so silent in this industry. I think when it happens, it's not the person saying, "I don't want to hire a black person." <laughs> it's well, if we hire someone, there'll be a problem above me, basically, and and everyone keeps sort of passing that upwards. No one, no one says it's their issue. It's I've been told I can't, I can only do this or that, you know. So it's that's why it's a hard thing to 
um, it's not like you can just remove one person and the problem solved. It's a, the, you have to kind of have a shift over the entire system um, so that everyone knows that everyone's jobs are good <laughs> if we if we move forward. Um, yeah. And that can happen. We've, uh, at the DGC, we've seen a massive shift on the female director side just in the last two and a half years, you know, from 23% of the jobs to 43% of the jobs in two years. So, and that was because of the, the entire system, everyone at every level went, this is now what we're doing. We're aiming for 50%. And, and so everyone was on board from the top to the bottom. Yeah. Um, but definitely you need, you need the, you need the top to get in trouble so that then they disseminate yeah. it down. <laughs> yeah. And, who, who's and I think that it. that's exactly it. And that's, and I think that happens by everyone talking about it. Right. Yeah. Now, Jem, you said that that happened earlier in your career as yeah. a director for hire. Yeah. Um, how would you handle that situation now then as a director for hire? Is it, is it different? Would you, would you speak out now? Oh, absolutely. I mean, now I've kind of, you know, a lot more um, power in a room to be, um, well, as the showrunner as well, I'm, I, I kind of do also have that kind of final say. And so it certainly happened less, um, you know, uh, the kind of more control I've had over a project, but it, it, um, it's still something, it's still an excuse that I hear, um, yeah. you know, that sort of takes the blame off of um, white producers because they're just saying it's not, it's, you know, yeah, like Zach said, I, you know, it's not us, it's above us. Um, but I've, I've heard it in, in casting rooms. I've heard different things in, in casting rooms as well. Um, and, um, Ricky, I know you said there are a lot of casting agents here in town who do try really hard. I've also experienced, uh, white casting directors who aren't trying hard enough. And, um, I've had to push to bring me, um, just diverse actors uh because uh we we see so many we see so many uh white actors and i remember one project in particular and i just i kept asking to see more people i kept asking to see more people to see more people i knew i wasn't being shown the talent that we have in this town um and uh, this person sort of, I think, was getting annoyed at my pushing and sort of turned around and said to me, they don't grow on trees. And, you know, that was their statement on it. That was, you know, um, that was kind of, they, yeah. it, was, and it was, it was shocking, but I was like, well, <laughs> just keep, it might, just keep going, keep looking. And, and there were, and we ended up, um, uh, casting um, uh, an actor of color in the, in the part uh, because I went away as well and, and was like, can you bring in these people? Mm -hmm. um, I, yeah, I think it's just going to take a, 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 a like I said, it's going to we as white people we have to um, we're going to have it's our fight as well and we have to speak up um, and we have to make things uncomfortable and we have to make things awkward. And um, yeah, you know, I think that that's just one example of many that comes to mind because I could tell it was uncomfortable and, and making it awkward, but I knew that we weren't seeing the talent that we have in this city. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I would love to open it to, um, like, like, first of all, Zach and Jem, do you, after, after listening to, to Andy and Miriam and Rukia speak, do you have any questions for them about their experiences or about anything that they were talking about? I mean, I, I, the whole reason I'm here is to listen because mm -hmm. that example of the hairdresser not knowing how to work with black hair or something as a director, I, I have the power to correct, but had no idea was an issue. Mm -hmm. um, like, wow. that's, a, that's a conversation it makes total sense, but it wasn't something I was aware of because it's never been brought to my attention. And yeah. so, but it's very easy to fix. And now anytime, you know, I have uh, a black actor on, on set, I'll know to get ahead of that. Um, so those types of specifics make, even though they're, um, 
they're happening on a regular basis don't necessarily aren't necessarily obvious to people who aren't experiencing it. So it's really helpful to hear that type of stuff because then they're very easy. Those are simple things uh, to fix and to make sure when, because directors are involved in interviewing the makeup team before they get hired. And often that's before we know who the actors are gonna be. But if we know that there are gonna be black actors, then that's a very easy thing to show me your portfolio of of black hair or have, what do you know about black hair? What are you gonna do with the black hair? It's very easy questions to ask and and to ensure that there's someone or bringing in someone that really does know that for those days is that's very simple to do uh, and would have never occurred to me had I not heard that. So those type of stories or to hear that is is, um, really, really valuable because it's, Mm -hmm. that's how you kind of can make those, those small changes, you know, throughout the whole system. Yeah, simple and yet huge. Right, yeah. like, because it's not, it's it. The, like as Ricky has said, those microaggressions add up. You know, um, what what about for Andy and Miriam and Rukia? Do you have any any questions uh, at all for our director producers? Um, any questions? Any statements? Anything that that you want to know about what goes on in in their in their realm? <laughs> I guess for me, just uh, as I've worked with Jem before, and Jem, thank you for hiring uh, me with uh, crazy hair and whatnot and crazy mm-hmm. swag, but uh, uh, more of your last show because you had a lot of uh, sort of black influence on that show. Could you speak on behalf a bit more on that, uh, on that show uh, in terms of utilizing a lot of black uh, people on the set? Yeah, I think Vagrant Queen for me was, um you know, one of the best experiences of my life. And um, I absolutely loved shooting in Cape Town as well because it was the most uh, diverse cast and crew uh, I've ever I've ever worked with. Um, and it just made for such a, uh, such a better production where we had so many, um, so many voices and I think um, I think the biggest thing I can say about being able to 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 hire uh, how we did is that it 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 does come from the top as well. You know, like I can say as a showrunner, this is what I want, um, but then I still answer to a network and a studio. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, I'm I'm honored that I had um, such a supportive uh, network exec at Sci-Fi who, you know. Um, when the project was first greenlit, I think even just before it was greenlit, when we were having conversations and I said, you know, this is important to me, um, that was, it was supported. Um, and there was no pushback, which, mm. you know, as I've sort of just kind of shared with you, I've experienced before when trying to bring on my more diversity. And there wasn't, there wasn't any of that. And um, it was so refreshing. It was um, such a wonderful experience uh and when you have that support at the top yeah it's everything Mm -hmm. yeah um and and just for for the record you even though you are based in vancouver vagrant queen did not shoot in vancouver correct no we're cape Cape town south africa yeah right Mm -hmm. okay um i had a question yes um that's for zach actually because you're repping dgc here um, yeah, well, right. Gem and I, Gem and I both sit both. on the same, yeah, directors. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, is there's been a huge initiative to hire more female directors? Uh, is there any such effort being uh, towards more diverse directors as well? Yeah, definitely. And we've done we've done a huge amount with what we can do. It's it's um, one of the first big obstacles we ran into. That Gem and I ran into when we first kind of got elected was we discovered that and this was not that long ago, three years ago, um, that it was illegal to sort of talk about any of the protective grounds and the human rights uh, when talking about hiring. Like, so when, if a studio was doing a specific show, for example, the terror that was about Japanese internment camps, mm. they, it was illegal for them to ask for Japanese directors because you can't discriminate based on race or Um, or sexuality or, you know, disability or any of those protective grounds. But we knew that um, 
in a lot of cases, someone's specific experience or their voice is really critical to telling a certain story. And so that if you're doing a, a movie about residential school, you might want an Aboriginal filmmaker <laughs> and you might want to, the guild wants to be able to be a part of that conversation saying, here's our Aboriginal filmmakers, here's our Japanese filmmakers or whatever the case may be. Um, and so we actually went to the Human Rights Tribunal um, and hired a bunch of lawyers and, and basically got them to give the, um, the DGG, DGC specifically an exemption uh, so in certain cases so that if, if a um, production or producer is creating a project that needs specific voices, um, either just to have a representational group or because the project itself is from a certain story or perspective that's needed. Um, it used to be that when Disney would call and say, who are your female directors or who are your black directors? It was illegal for us to say that. Um, mm -hmm. Now what we're allowed to do, uh, we just got the approval is for the directors who self-identified any of their protective traits, um, no, they've basically, allow, we've allowed our members to, to self-identify any of the traits that they would like to be known in the hiring process when appropriate. And we can then provide that information to the employer, assuming they have a bona fide sort of vetted um, diversity program and sort of, and it's, you know, done with respect rather than, because there's always a danger in, in that information being used negatively. So we've mm. done a lot of work to make sure that it's, it's voluntary and it's with, with um, places that are that are using that information to, because of the Human Rights Tribunal, when we made our case, it was very clear that those rules, which are there to make sure that when someone's hiring a waitress, it doesn't matter what race they are, <laughs> it makes a lot of sense. Um, it was clear that those rules were preventing, to kind of preventing the ability to, to fix the discrimination that was happening. Um, because when people were even wanting to, to have representational, um, you know, crew or cast or whatever, we weren't able to to do anything to help. So now we can, and that's been really great. Um, that one of the obstacles we ran into is it's it's a, it, we've gotten the legality in Canada, but a lot of the people we're dealing with are American, and in some cases it's their corporations that are still it's still illegal for them to basically consider a race when considering employment, and so it's hard to have those conversations because they're worried about getting sued saying that they're considering that at all. Um, but in other cases, they are very overt about it and we're there to kind of try and promote the members that we have. I, I was furrowing my brow because I'm like, okay, so it's illegal for them to talk about race, but they will come up here and do their all white show and then hire the token person of color and that's legal. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but to, but to talk about it about you know the 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 creative you know the team and who's involved that that's not legal. Hmm. Interesting. Also, yeah. I just I wanted mean, to say that social has to be a social thing so that it becomes a movement that everyone's subscribing to, um, and right. that you know things like this are really powerful so that it becomes something that you don't even think about. I mean, that's when you asked earlier, what's the success? level that we want to get to it's it's where there is there's no stigma like i one one example of that that i think of is is my mom is a is a producer and you know, was a producer her whole, whole life and there really isn't a stigma to i would maybe i'm totally wrong because i'm a, a male <laughs> saying this but in general i've worked with so many female producers when, when you meet a female producer nobody thinks you're a woman and you're producing like there's no way you could produce maybe that's true but in general i've worked with so many that it seems like uh, in that specific role, no one really thinks about gender if you're a producer. And ideally, you know, you, you aim to get to the place where um, that no one's thinking you can't do this because of any of your protective traits. And Mary, I was, Mary, Mary, you're about to say. Yeah, thank you. That like, I really appreciate Zach, you bringing in the languaging of human rights, because I feel like yeah. that is something that I usually as well go to in terms of advocating for like, more diverse voices on the team or in that particular project. And I really appreciated Jem as well, you just being honest about some of your experiences because the issue when we keep like deflecting things to the higher ups, is like, it takes forever for change to happen. So we need to feel like we're all invol involved in, in this fight because we are and do the work internally for you to understand that, that you have decision-making power and you can make a change and make a difference. Because when I hear 
that story that you said that like, okay, we can hire one black actor, but if we hire another, then it's a black movie. And then that doesn't sell, or that's not what we want to do. I'm like, where's the humanity in that? Mm. Yeah. Um, we, we are starting to uh, get some questions from our audience. Uh, and if you have questions, please please ask them on uh, on Facebook and and on YouTube, and uh, we will we will try to get to as many as possible. Um, this this question is from uh, Andy, uh, and it's directed to Zach and Jem. Can you ex can you expand on how the DGCBC is expanding uh, their roster of uh, BIPOC directors? How do you get on the list? Can you get on the list if you're not a member of DGC? Lay yeah, it I mean, it's a, it's a it's a tricky thing because the DGC basically um, isn't is the requirement to join is that you've gotten a job. So in some ways, obviously, there's a systematic <laughs> oppression of who's getting those jobs, and so that kind of there's no there's no filter, there's no jury that says you're, okay, we're picking these people or that people to to join the DGC. It's just basically who's getting the work. So then our efforts have to be on sort of outside of the DGC, trying to support um, any of the places that promote artists um, like the Crazy Eights. We, you know, we were the presenting sponsor of the Crazy Eights. I sit on the jury of the Crazy Eights um, and funding the organizations that are, that are fueling a diverse filmmaker group at the beginning of their career so that they um, have the type of work that then gets them hired. And once they're hired, basically, they just sort of automatically join the DGC. Yeah. At that point. Okay. Um, I I also wanted to ask you, uh, Zach, because uh, you had kind of alluded to this before. Um, we are. I, I asked this of our other of our of our black artists at the beginning, but you know we are a service town. You know, even if the DGC has a, a certain stance and UBCP and all the various guilds and unions have a stance, if if we are continuing to service these productions like do you think it's possible to fight anti-black racism while we are producing shows that hold mm -hmm. to the old formula you know and like i guess also like what kind of power like can the d like what can the dgc do on its own you know and like does it really have that kind of power you know when dealing with with american yeah. productions i mean it's it, it takes everyone, it takes a whole movement of people and it takes putting pressure at the highest level. Like if the reason we went from 20% to 40% women in two years is because the studios put a 50% requirement onto their shows. Right. And that sort of forced the change because then everyone knew our show's only greenlit if we do this. And it, so you need to, but to get to that point took sort of two years of Me Too and, and all the different organizations putting pressure, um, you know, human organizations and labor organizations putting pressure at the corporate level so um, you know that's in a lot of ways uh, what we can do and and beyond that it's it's trying to just promote and show those voices as much as we can um, so that there's not so much of a stigma around it yeah okay. yeah and Sabrina just to add a, a point on to Zaxon it was a um, something uh, I just wanted to add after Miriam, your last point as well. I think, you know, it is, like you said, Zach, it's gonna take, uh, it's gonna take that pressure. And I've been seeing it more, um, I've been seeing the sort of beginnings of that change recently when more uh, white people speak out about uh, what they've experienced uh, and, and um, a lot of those microaggressions um, just as an example, um, you know, Hallmark and Lifetime have recently been called out for, uh, you know, never allowing, you know, uh, interracial couples on screen. Um, and it was always so subtle. Uh, it, these are never written rules, right? They're always sort of whispered and spoken about and on phone calls. You're not going to find these rules written down. And so, but they're there and everyone that's worked on these movies know that they're there um, and they, it's always just been sort of quiet and swept under the rug and we've only recently been starting to talk about it and suddenly you know now these companies can't deny it when we talk about it and we put it in the open and so now you know they're 
they got their backs up and they're well, like, they, oh, we're, we're they not. Did okay, deny it. We'll do it. <laughs> like Hallmark did deny it this morning saying, we've never had that policy. Like, uh, and we're okay. calling everyone we work with to tell them we don't yep. have that policy. Yeah. But well, no, yeah. that's the type of pressure that you need is you need them to be saying that because well, yeah, yeah, exactly. people are, now they're having well, to prove that they don't have that policy. And and it's exactly, we saw that with um, when everybody spoke out after, you know, they showed uh, the commercial. They, they showed, yeah, the, how mm. homophobic they were. Mm. And again, it's always been just quietly and like swept under the rug. And, and then when you put it in their face and we're all loud about it, they are mm. forced to um, to make a statement, no, we are not homophobic no we are not racist no and then it's like okay great prove it so yeah. we just we have to keep calling it out and we have to um yeah we have to be loud about it you know the thing about that though like i will say a lot of like pocs have been talking about that mm -hmm. kind of like our, i think sabrina even mentioned like um on our like panels and etc but the thing with which was powerful about that particular call out like that's also um a white person saying okay I'm saying this now. And because of us living in a white supremacist society, it's like you're heard in a way in which we cannot be heard. Yeah. And it's like when you use that in allyship with us, it's like that's when we can really, unfortunately that's how it ha has to work, but that really helps us in our like liberation struggle. Yeah, yeah. well specifically yeah. it has to, as a corporation, if they know that their audience is upset about it, then they'll really, <laughs> then they'll <listen. laughs> that's when they'll yeah. really pay attention. Yeah, yeah. yeah like, no, you're exactly right. We have to use, yeah, that's, we have to use our privilege. I that also, to, to is it possible that we in Vancouver are more powerful as an industry than we give ourselves credit for, you know, and like, is, is it possible that we have leverage as a, as a place with the, the tax credits and this, you know, the incredible infrastructure and stuff that instead of just being like so grateful that, you know, these productions want to shoot up here, we're going to let them cast however they want to, that maybe it should be like an honor and a privilege to shoot up here and to, to do things, you know, to, to be pushing for, you know, what, what are essentially human rights and and casting that reflects the world in which we live, you know? I, and I wonder what would need to happen in order for that, you know, just to, to be just the way it is to exercise our privilege as a film industry. Um, yeah, I mean, that would be very powerful. Uh, would, I think in general, LA is generally fairly unaware of Canada <laughs> and, and what we think or what we're doing, but we doesn't mean we can't try. Um, I, I, I'm reading a lot in the comments and people are talking about allyship and um, what that could could look like. Um, you know, what what do you what qualities do you think are are required to be a good white ally, especially in this in this historic moment because it does feel like a yeah, historic yeah, moment just, i mean I, I i would just say listening and taking and taking action and speaking up when you see something that's wrong i mean that's pretty those are pretty simple but i imagine making sure you're listening to the things you're unaware of and then if you see something making sure to speak up against it i i would think that you know if that, if you're trying to change anything about yourself personal growth is always the hardest thing and we all know if there's a if you're in a personal growth uh, state, um, it's going to be uncomfortable. So being comfortable in the discomfort is really, really important, um, and that requires, as Zach said, listening and being open-hearted, so that there can be an understanding between both people. Yeah, and I was also just going to say education. Mm -hmm. you educate yourself. Mm -hmm the more empowered you're also mm -hmm. gonna feel because you're gonna feel like, okay, I, I have something to stand on here. I have the languaging, I have some understanding of like the context. Um, mm -hmm. And that's gonna be, make it easier for you to stand alongside with us when we speak out about things like on set or in any part of the production, you can say, okay, wait a minute. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm with this and I can at least create the space where this person feels safe and heard and validated instead of like we all mentioned, um, shamed or feeling like they're putting, um, their career on the line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it kind of goes back yeah. to what uh, I mentioned earlier, you know, and, and touching base in the in education is, it's our turn now to kind of bring up the younger 
filmmakers specifically in Vancouver and sort of teach them and, and, and show them that there should be no need for, uh, you know, blacks over here, whites over here, Asians over here, and that we're all in this together. I mean, again, it, I remember going to film school, there was only two black people, mm -hmm. you know, okay. and, and everybody else was white. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, luckily, it, 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 I, I was accepted <laughs> within the, the the white film industry community here. But yeah, it, you know, I would love to see more empowering of, of younger uh, black kids that do want to get into this industry that pretty much understand that all they're watching are white shows. Yeah. Uh, to get in and say, you know what, I do want to stand up for myself. I think the camera is a very powerful tool that you can utilize uh, to get our voices heard. So. Yeah. yeah, one one um, sort of really unique perspective I've had on that has been, I've been on the jury for the Crazy Eights for many years, over the, probably at least the last seven years. And and we've seen a massive, and, and that's a, and just so if people aren't aware of the Crazy Eights, it's basically anyone can apply and then you come in and you pitch in front of a jury. So unlike the hiring world, there's sort of no filter for who comes in the door. And we've massively seen that shift over the last seven years. So. Um, you know, like seven years ago, we were, we, you know, we would circle every female director that came in because it was like, okay, we've got a, a female directors come in. Let's make sure. Let's let's. We want to make sure we're being as representational as we can. And then we, you know, and obviously we were then looking for indigenous filmmakers and black filmmakers and Asian filmmakers and just trying to kind of always make sure at the end of the process that not only were we picking the best films and the best filmmakers, but it was a group that, um, you know, represented the city. Um, and it was pretty remarkable because I've kind of kept track over time of those numbers. And the, you know, maybe four years ago, we were seeing this massive rise in female directors coming in the door mm -hmm. to the point yeah. where I think we, you know, it was it was probably two two years ago it was the maybe it was three years ago. I don't exactly remember, but the majority of the people coming in the door were female. And yeah. then to the point where like last year, I think it was 70% of the directors coming in the door were female. Um, to the point where we didn't have to no longer really think about that. It just, and then last year, the the group of films that got put out last year, literally we just picked the best films. And because of the massive diverse nature of the group of filmmakers that came in, we're like, oh, okay, these are our top six. Let's just make sure. And we're like, oh, we're good. Like it wasn't, it didn't have to be a conversation anymore at that mm -hmm. level. Now yeah. there's a huge leap between a short film festival that's bringing people in and, and picking the best artists they want to support compared to hiring people. There's a bigger wall there for artists to jump over, but at least at the entrance of the industry, at the open funnel of sort of anyone being able to walk in the door, there's been a huge shift to the point where the jury doesn't really have to talk that much about it anymore just because the group that comes in is naturally representational. I think on behalf of the uh, the film industry, uh, Zach, you made a good point, you know, sort of, I, I hate to say it and bring it up, but, you know, I don't want this racial thing to become a box that you're going to tick. Okay, we hired the black person. Okay, good. Okay, tick. We've hired the indigenous person, you know, because again, you know, after all of this is done, the, something else will happen. It will get swept under the rug, you know, and then... Uh, perhaps the film industry here will say, okay, we need to have a percentage of people on set that are black. I also don't want that to be done, you know, because again, it's just going to be another yeah. ticking of those boxes. So how do we work towards me feeling like I wasn't ticked on a box to get hired to be on this job because I'm <laughs> black and you needed some black cinematographer or black producer. I think that's such a complicated situation and it's definitely something that we on the juries i've sat on we we are we worry about even that question like you're you're trying to uh build a representational group but is the very act of doing that part of the problem so it's it's a very complicated thing um, it's a very you know, you're it, in in some ways you know, you're looking at the industry has all sorts of ways it's trying to right the wrongs that it's had and you and in some ways you could call that affirmative action that it's trying to promote certain people over others which is great but it's a really complicated there's a there's so many complications when you do that um both for the people you're promoting and for the people that you're not including and it's there's i don't think there's a 
a simple answer to that because it's you're both trying to help, but with helping comes comes really tough questions. Mm -hmm. Something that I wanted to make sure though was spoken about this pan like on this panel, something that I just wanted to say um, for myself is that like if we also want to move towards um, really fighting anti-blackness, we also have to take a real hard look at colorism. Yeah. This Thank is you. huge for me to talk about um, because we have to look at like who's our, which bodies are we promoting as the black bodies and which forms of blackness are we deeming as acceptable, less threatening, et cetera, et cetera. Like why is a light skinned person always in the like a pleasing role and then we're gonna put the dark skinned people in like these more thuggish, lower income roles, like that stuff too mm. is huge. And that is also yeah. here in Vancouver and we need to get vocal about that and we need to call it out and we need a total transformation of that whole system. And yeah. Yeah, I think that, one of the things that would be really great is the, the more that you have people of color in the number one and two slot, the more that it'll solve that. Because often what happens is working directors is we get hired and the leads are already cast. <laughs> and then and then we're hired and we want to be we want to make sure the rest of the cast is is representational. But then those are all the sort of smaller and often the villain roles. And so then you <laughs> then you're really stuck because you're like, well, <laughs> I want to hire uh, a really representational cast here, but all of the leads are already cast before I come on. And so the more that you can put people of color in those, you know, and Jem and I have both worked on shows with black people in the number one slots, then then it's a lot easier to kind of have that conversation because then um, you're not having the debate of like, well, the only person I'm allowed to cast right now is the villain. Do I, mm -hmm. you know, what's the right choice here? Yeah, yeah, Zach's right. Like. It's, it's exactly that as a director for hire, you can, you, there's often your leads are cast and that's why now as producers, we both now are in a position that we are able to, um, you know, make the changes in the, in the number one on the call sheet. And Rukia, I am so sorry, that damn robot. So, <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to... <laughs> so, I want to cool he might not be happy about it. Either. <laughs> it made the robot black, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> we are talking about Android Employed, season two of Android Employed. I don't want to. I want to give a plug for that because it is one of my favorite things uh, on the interwebs. Um, one of the questions that we have received uh, is about about next steps. You know, so this is the question. Speaking up is definitely constructive. But beyond this, what would each of you on the panel propose that we BIPOC watching take away today as a concrete action step for improvement? Um, improvement of anti-racism in, in yeah. film and TV. Well, it all depends on what position you hold. As an actor, I'm, I always think it's the most parasitic career choice I could have made. Right? I don't get hired unless someone else is hired. Um, Ooh. Echoing back to what Andy was saying about checking boxes, uh, it's something that I often am like, am I hired because I'm black? And then I hear white actresses go, it's probably gonna go ethnic. Um, and that completely negates my talent mm -hmm. um, and has me doubting whether I actually deserve this part or not. And that's something I still struggle with even after winning an award, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, people of color, still work on your talent. You know, at the end of the day, it's all about upholding great storytelling. And that only happens if the talent and the creativity is at the highest level. Um, then that can't be taken away from you. Um, so that's one thing moving forward. I say stay the course and work on your craft. Yeah. That that statement going ethnic, um, yeah. I've, I've heard more of that in the last few years. Um, both from uh, people of color who are upset that they're being dismissed as I got the role, like that the white person on the set is saying that I got the role because it went ethnic. And also because, of, and I've heard it from white filmmakers or, you know, white actors, white filmmakers being like, this is the hardest time to be, you know, a white filmmaker, you know, or actors, oh, they were going ethnic. So I'm not gonna like, what, what response do you have to, to that, to, to those kind of statements. Cause like in my, like I'm thinking about what you said about microaggressions before. That statement seems like a massive microaggression. It's not, it's not so micro. No, it's, it's massive. Not so micro. It's so aggressive. <laughs> but, but people will say it as if it's, 
as if it's nothing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, I mean, I suppose it's a reality for white actors right now. And I'm assuming white male directors. I've had a number of white male directors be like, Hey, Rikia, are you interested in directing? Because you would work. Yeah. And, um, and I'm like, well, actually, yes, I am interested in directing, but that has nothing to do with my color. It's just a curiosity. And, um, and whenever, I mean, I'm used to microaggressions. I've done my whole life with microaggressions, so I'm better equipped with them. I think Andy and Miriam might say they're also pretty equipped to deal with it. You just stay the course and um, you just keep going. I mean, I have to trust that my talent is what's keeping me here. And it's nice that the tokenism is allowing my talent to come forward and I can show who I am. Um, I also wanted to add, it's kind of a sidebar, um, because I have been given an opportunity, it's allowed my craft to grow. So if mm. people of color who are artists aren't given a shot, their craft can't grow. There's only so many classes that you can take before you need onset experience. Yeah. And um, and if we are only hiring certain people, they're gonna their craft gets the opportunity to grow and to be seen. And um, and so the tokenizing, I, I think, is an obvious thing that happens, and it sucks, and it has people of color um, doubting themselves. But it also has us improving our talent and it's our 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 our, our, our artistry. Yeah. And um, and eventually, I think the pendulum will settle, maybe not in our lifetime, hopefully, we will probably all be wrinkly and old by then. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I think now is the time where things have to be really uncomfortable. And I might have been hired because I'm black. And, you know, this white actor might not have been hired because he was white. And that just might have to be what it is right now until we can get this pendulum to, to settle. Yeah, And on behalf of that, you know, going back to sort of the workplace uh, when I've been hired on, you know, specifically uh, the, the Netflix show which was kind of the, the biggest thing I've done so far. There was a few younger black actors. Um, and I don't want to say that I was hired because I was, you know, the, the token black uh, cinematographer that was up for the job, but they, they're also wanting to connect people, um, you know? And so I, I feel sometimes when, when I'm hired that I have to go above and beyond yeah. to kind of showcase I am talented. And I've had tons of conversations uh, with my own business partner, with my parents, you know, and, and, and just about like, am I good enough? Like, what what is it about me that they don't want? You know, and, and, and then I have to go and relook at my demo reel or I have to second guess some of my work that I've done in the past, you know, and then I see somebody, of, of uh, a white guy landing the job or, whether a white girl landing the job. And so uh, I think it's, it's, it has helped <laughs> in, in a lot of ways, kind of uh, be more bold uh, and kind of be a louder voice when I go on set. I mean, most of you that have been on set with me, you know, I, I tend to be uh, very firm political, but also very friendly. But I feel like sometimes I have to stand even taller mm -hmm. to just kind of, uh, try to make sure that they're okay with my work uh, as a person of color to move forward and maybe I get hired by them again. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have a question for our directors from Marie Peters, uh, who wants to know, are there mentorship and shadowing opportunities being worked on for BIPOC folk? Yeah, I mean, the DGC um, has actually been something Jim and I've been working on uh, for about a year is starting in, in general in the past, the DGC hasn't taken an active role in um, shadowing and observing and those types of uh, positions. And we've been starting to build um, programs to be able to do that. Uh, some of them have dedicated, uh, you know, diversity parts built into them. Um, there's one that was just announced with the CMF specifically for female directors uh, to get paid while they observe so that it's a paid position. Um, others in general, we've been uh, taking the approach of presenting, um, you know, it's a tricky thing with the DGC because we're elected as a labor organization to represent all the members, but at the same time you wanna do things to correct the issues. And so 
it's hard for us to exclude people, but it but we can try and help promote people if that's if that's the line we have to walk. Um, and so uh, we've been uh, creating opportunities. They're not ready yet, but it's something we've been working on quite a bit to basically allow. Um, you know, it's going to be tough. A lot of them were, were getting ready to go, but then because of COVID, there's a lot less people sort of going to be on set. So it's going to be a while until mm -hmm. we're allowed to have shadows on set again because they're just mm -hmm. trying to limit the body count as much as possible. But it's something we're, we've been working on for about a year and we're hoping to kind of, we were planning on releasing it this year, but things have been uh, kind of thrown for a loop. We've also been working really heavily with the studios um, because really it's their call, it's their sets. Um, and so we've been, uh, specifically Warner Brothers is getting ready to launch an entire um, observing program in Canada. And we've been working with them and that's through their um, diversity and inclusivity department. So um, we're basically there to, to help and as much as we can. Okay. We're going to be wrapping this up very soon. Um, I just want to make sure that we have said everything that you want to say today. I, I know this is only, I mean, this conversation has been going on for years. It will continue into the future. We hope the people who are new to the conversation will stick around, do the hard work, have the conversations. If you're white, have the conversations with your white colleagues and your white peers. Um, but just for, for today, my, my panelists, is there is there anything that we have not touched on that you want to make sure we get out there? Uh, for me personally, I mean, I think it's it's very important for uh, people to reach out, you know, and, and whether it's black to black or, or even white to black, you know, uh, I don't ever want people to sort of be shy because of, uh, I'm colored and they feel like, oh, I don't talk like he talks. I don't walk like he walks. Uh, you know, I think there needs to be representation and I feel the only way we're going to be heard is by, yes, by people listening, but also by people reaching out, mm -hmm. you know. One thing I've been working on a lot personally, and I would I, I think it's worth saying just in case there's other writers or people that are creators that are listening that maybe are white um, or a white male um, has been, there is a lot of responsibility when you're creating characters because that's where a lot of this starts mm -hmm. um, to, especially when you're creating a character and this is something Jem's helped me a lot with and she could probably speak to, but when you're creating a character who is part of a minority of some kind, whether it be race or sexuality or anything like that, that you're not writing that person as someone who is defined by that trait, that they're a character in every other way of, you know, they have their own desires and their own goals and their own weaknesses and all of those things that aren't bound by, this is the black character, so they're gonna, so they're gonna be the black stereotype. Just making sure they're, they're as developed and, and, and have all of the different colors of a character can have uh, so that they, they're they not defined by their trait. They're not de mm -hmm. defined by being the gay character. They they also like to cook, which is something that anyone <laughs> could yeah. have, you know, like kind of just thinking of it that way um, as a creator is really important so that as your work kind of goes out into the universe, it's not perpetrating any negative stereotypes, but it's also showing that um, characters don't have to be defined by their characteristics, you know, by their uh, protected grounds. Yeah, yeah, no, I think we, uh, that's an important note to make, Zach, as writers as well, um, and creators, we have that responsibility. Um, and, you know, I've enjoyed some of our internal conversations about uh, making sure that, you know, um, that we're writing with those characters as well. Um, and these were big discussions that we had on, um, Vagrant Queen as well, and and while we were filming it, uh, um, the the lead actress and I, Adrian, would often have discussions on, um, you know, about the show we were creating and about kind of how proud we were to to be making this show, um, but that pride and happiness would kind of quickly become um, something something um i don't know it would quickly fall when we realized you know the reason we're proud is because we've got this uh, we have a black queer female lead in a sci-fi 
and we felt pride in that. And then that sort of went when we realized we're proud because we're the only one. I can't name any others. Between us right now, we're, we're struggling to name other shows and movies like that. And so, you know, it quickly becomes like, I'm glad we're doing this. We need to be doing this, but we shouldn't, we shouldn't be struggling to name any others. And so, um, you know, moving forward as creators, we have that responsibility um, that, uh, you know, yeah, to, to, to see more content like this. I think I just wanted to give like a big shout out to young people. I guess I'm also on the panel here representing kind of like the youth, um, but specifically as well to like um, the young black people who are tuning in and just like in general right now, like you've been looking at the States, like how Gen Z is just really helping to forward the movement for black lives. Like your voice is so strong and so powerful and like, as black artists, you already know these things that you, that you will encounter in this industry, like you will in any other space. Um, but just know that there are people here, like on this panel, that have gone before you, that are willing to do what we can to make it easier, give you tips. So just don't hesitate to reach out because um, what we do, we also do for you, is to open up that door for more voices to come through. So just yeah, keep going. Yeah, absolutely. I was I, I wanted to say earlier on in the conversation, uh, Zach and I mentioned some programs that we're trying to set up at the DGC. Um, but you know, these are for members and just, you know, to let viewers know that uh, you know, my DMs are open to uh, up and coming uh, creatives, uh, black indigenous people of color to reach out for any advice um, that, that they need. Um, just uh, kind of wanted to put it out there that, you know, my DMs are open for uh, any of those discussions. Mm -hmm. um, I'll I'll say that um, I echo what everyone said. I love. I was going to actually say uh, something similar to you, Zach, about the narratives that are told in our stories and how they need to. They can't. We have to stop perpetuating them. Uh, mm -hmm. That is with you know deciding who the number one, and number two on the show is going to be. That's the eye of the uh, that the audience goes through the story with. Um, that also uh, is related to knowing the history of American film and TV. Um, I wrote an, uh, an op-ed for Sabrina's YVR screen scene. I think it's coming out on Monday. Um, there are a lot of links in it to a lot of resources so you can know your history and know where statistics are at right now. Um, one great resource is um, a Real Racism in Hollywood. Uh, there's two books out there. Um, I have a link in my article to one of them um, where they discuss the history of uh, black people and how the portrayals of black people are in history from the beginning of cinema to what we see today. Mm -hmm. And it, I think it is absolutely critical to know this history so that when non-black people are writing roles, that they're not falling back into these stereotypes where you don't even know you're falling mm. back into these stereotypes. Mm. And I think it's absolutely critical to know this history. Um, so I urge every filmmaker out there, anyone who's interested in film and TV to, uh, to just Google, that's what I did. <laughs> and, and find- Google's your friend. <laughs> and, and Google's your friend and find these resources um, so that the 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 opinions of black people can be shifted and so black people aren't targeted like we are with police and seen as criminals and other negative stereotypes yeah well i think one just to add to that i think as a writer the first thing i do and i found it massively helpful and it's something every writer should do it isn't just to google but is to if you're writing something that is to, that has a, a character in it that isn't part of a world that you're a part of is to show that to other people that are, are part of that world early in your process. Cause there's things that you're just unaware of. Um, you know, I, there's a script that I was working on a few months ago that has um, actually Latino black leads in it. And one, the, at one point the dad, you know, tussles the kid's hair and, you know, we showed it to some, or some of my, you know, black friends and they were like, no dad is touching her daughter's black hair, <laughs> like ever. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was just like that's a detail that I would have never, you know, been aware of that was e easy to fix um, and had developed them as characters. But there were there's always details that you miss, and so just making sure to show it 
to people that are part of those communities that you're not part of early so that you're that you're you know being representational of of those details yeah and i and i know that there are are organizations you know like um pacific screenwriting program that is also trying to nurture uh, artists of color to to get you know our our television series writers rooms you know more representative of the world <laughs> which i think yeah. is also going to be important moving forward andy mariam rakia zach jem thank you all for joining us today for your generosity of your time and your expertise i i appreciate you all very much uh, and I am going to also thank VAF and throw to Lin Lee from VAF as well. Thank you so much, Sabrina. That was amazing. And thank you so much to Rukia, Miriam, Andy, Zach, and Jem um, for, for speaking the truth, um, for having these very uncomfortable conversations. And, and this is really just the beginning. And we know that um, the people have power as, as long as we voice our opinions, our, we voice things out, there can be change. And if you, uh, all the viewers watching enjoyed the show and want to tell your friends, please tell them to tweet or go on Instagram and come back on Facebook at VAF Vancouver, hashtag VAF, hashtag DIF2020. You can view this program again on right here on our Facebook and on our YouTube channel. And um, we're also going to be uh, broadcasted on uh, Sabrina Furminger's um, YVR Screen Scene podcast. I'm not sure if we have a link. If not, I'm sure it's, it's very easy to find. Um, and I just wanted to take a moment. Um, this has been our very last diversity in filmmaking virtual panel series, and uh, it's been a ride. We've, um, we've started planning all this since April, and uh, a lot has happened since April. We were only dealing with, you know, a shutdown and then racism and more racism, and, and now the world is changing. Uh, but I wanted to really thank um, the producing team. Uh, and uh, I want to introduce our producing team on, I think we have a visual. Yes, okay. Uh, so because of technical difficulties, uh, we couldn't uh, actually bring the entire team on, but I really wanted um, to thank uh, Joshua Lamb, uh, Arnold Lim, Natch Dusty Mehta, who is um, who's controlling uh, the background right now, Regina Liang, uh, our media director, and again, Mayumi Yoshida, uh, thank you so much for organizing um, today's panel. It's been amazing, some really important conversations were had and hopefully will continue. And VAV uh, will continue to uh, bring to you uh, panels and uh, discussions um, throughout the year uh, during our festival as well in November. Uh, and we're also um, trying to, to help uh, in, in all different ways. Um, and uh, we're, we're actually run entirely by volunteers. So if you can please, please, please support us by um, attending our programs as well as making a donation at FAV, uh, thank you for uh, website at FAV, Dot org that would be most appreciated. We also have been um, uh, trying to, oh, sorry, I want to thank our, our healthcare professionals and um, first responders and essential workers. Um, they really have kept us safe throughout this time and uh, really want to thank them. Uh, and VAF actually has created a program because of the rise of anti-Asian racism that's been rampant. And you may have seen our program Eliminate Hate, which is a multimedia campaign that encourages people to submit reports of any racist incidents that you observe or you have experienced. And also um, as for friends or uh, you yourself can make 60 second PSAs or public service announcements and submit to the website eliminate uh, eliminatehate.org as you can see on the visual here hashtag eliminate number hate and go on the uh, on the social media sites and our website for updates also tomorrow night we have another program uh, brought to you by our host Milton Ng you can watch us 
live on Facebook and Instagram. And this is a fun program called Ask Me Anything, which is going to happen at 2 p.m. And our special guest tomorrow, who Milton will be speaking with, is Stephanie Pham, an actress, model, and martial artist. It's going to be fun. So if you actually have any questions, you can ask her anything and send them to ama at fav.org. Now, lastly, before I go, we also are very, very excited to bring to you the next big thing happening at FAB. So the annual Mighty Asian Movie Making Marathon is in its 15th year. So MAM15 is going to launch on Monday, June 15th. You will be able to find all the details and uh, how to enter uh, all the rules uh, because of COVID-19, uh, et cetera, on our website and also on Facebook and Instagram. So, so check back on Monday, June 15th to find out all the details and um, hope you will enter. So thank you again for those who tune in today and for those who have joined us for the past six weeks. It really has been amazing. I wish you safe and see you at our next FAF event. Thank you. <laughs>